All right, so welcome back everyone for the last talk on the last day of the workshop. And uh, great to have Adam Weirman here for talking about uh, power predictions and online optimization. Thanks. Yeah, I had the last talk at the boot camp too, so I think uh, the organizers are trying to tell me something. <laughs> so uh, so this, is, this talk is about predictions. Uh, and I guess the motivation here is that really, in almost any online algorithms problem or online decision problem uh, that you do in real life, you have some sort of forecast or prediction uh, that you're using. Uh, and yet, as algorithm designers, we, we don't really have a very good sense of how to use that information to design better algorithms. And so, you know, concretely, you know, if you think about how we use predictions, you know, I came up, I, I flew in today, and so I woke up today down in, you know, uh, Pasadena. I had to look at the weather at Berkeley to decide what to wear. You know, then when I got here on the plane, I had to figure out whether to take BART or Uber to get here. And you know, all of these tools have predictions, forecasts that you make use. I then wanted to see how, what the impact of the Tesla uh, Sun City merger was on my portfolio. Uh, so I, that's what I was doing in the car. And you know, then I'm booking my next flight for coming up in a few weeks. Uh, and so you look at that. And all of these you know, forecasts are crucial in these decision makings. And actually, philosophically, if you, if you talk to a neuroscientist these days, the, the best understanding we have of the brain is as a prediction machine. So you know, there's a small little bit of it that's used for activation, uh, but most of our brain is actually used for making predictions. And in some sense, uh, you know, that's that's what what we do in our lives with almost every decision we make. And as you know, as algorithms people, as computer scientists, we 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 know a lot about making predictions. We feel like we have lots of tools. We can do this pretty well. There are a lot of talks in this workshop and over this term about how do you make good predictions. But there have been very few talks or, or papers really thinking about how you use the predictions. And, the, and what I mean by use is, you know, think about just as a thought experiment, would you do a different algorithm uh, for route planning in a graph, for example, if you knew your predictions were precise or if you knew they were, you know, had some heavy tailed noise or Gaussian noise, would that impact the way you designed the algorithm at all? I don't think we have a good answer for that. Uh, and same thing with, you know, that's even in the IID case. But if you think of correlation, you know, if, you're, if your noise is IID versus short-term correlated versus long-term correlated, clearly that should change the way your algorithm uses the prediction. Uh, and we don't have a guide, or at least I don't have a guide for how to do that right now. And I think this is something that practitioners, you know, the side of me that works on, on really designing algorithms for data centers and smart grid and stuff, you're using forecasts, you know a lot about their accuracy, their correlation structure, and yet, I have no idea how to use that to change what I do for my control algorithms, my online algorithms. And so kind of, you know, I think that's, that's the vision here. And I'd say there's a lot of work on algorithm design that uses predictions, but not on how to guide an algorithm. So, so if you think of this, and, and the reason for this is really it's a hard problem to model. So what do we mean by using predictions in an algorithm? If you, you know, think about people in this room, and myself included, most of the things that we do were some sort of worst case view of prediction. And, and we saw a few of these today, where you know, the prediction is in some sense a little bit noisy in part of the instance. Maybe there's a few data points with some noise, or an adversary controls a few. But then it's perfect in the rest of the instance. And so there's this sense in which you're really optimistic uh, about the things that you know being perfect and real or near perfect and really pessimistic about the things that you don't know being adversarial and you know as a tool for modeling the impact of predictions on algorithms this is problematic because you're sort of, sort of simultaneously you know going in two different directions with your model and who knows which is going to win uh, then you know the stochastic community I know there's a bunch of people you know that work with even some models there and, and our results there you, you take a stochastic assumption about something that's underlying maybe you make a prediction of that process but any result you get about algorithm design there is going to be really fragile to the underlying stochastic assumptions in that model uh, and it's, it's not clear that that's the right way to go either. The systems people, you know, I have my share of systems papers where all you do is you take an algorithm, you throw in some predictions, you see if they work. Uh, if they work, great. But now you're just using forecast, you're using old data. How is this going to extend in the real world? It's, it's just, none of it is very satisfactory when you think about designing an algorithm that uses predictions and how those predictions should impact the design of the algorithm. And I think, you know, it kind of really ties into the semester in this workshop where you need something between these. You need a way of, capturing some of what you know in the stochastic noise of the predictions while still capturing enough of the adversarial viewpoint that you can uh, you know, get be model free to some extent or robust to some extent in your results. 
So this talk is basically an attempt that we've been doing for the last year and a half or two uh, to try to build some models and some analysis techniques that allow you to look at predictions in this beyond worst case way. And we basically have been able to get a, uh, you know, a first set of results along this line of how structure of prediction noise should impact algorithm design in one or two particular examples at this point. And the one where we have the richest story is online optimization, and so that's what I'll talk about today. We've also done it in some demand response problems, and we're working on it in some scheduling problems. So I can tell you about those offline if you're interested. But the idea is really to say, you know, how should the structure of prediction noise impact algorithm design? Uh, and so we'll do this in an online convex optimization. And to really make predictions crucial, we'll look at a, a little tweak of the standard OCO model, where you have a switching cost or a regularizer uh, in, the, in the cost function. And so the story is, you know, just like standard OCO, you pick a point in some convex action space. Then you're presented with a convex cost function. You pay a cost according to that function. Then you pick another point. You're, uh, and the difference from the standard is, you pay a cost, a nor some norm for the difference between those two choices. Uh, and then you incur the cost on that, you know, the next convex action place and so on. And you keep going this way, and so you have your switching cost for how far you're moving between rounds, and you have your action cost or your operation cost uh, from the uh, cost function for that round. So that's the model. And so here it is, you know, you're choosing X, you're presented cost, et cetera. You have your, co your convex cost here, and you have some norm as a switching cost, and you're just trying to minimize cost in an online way. Uh, we'll get to predictions, the idea uh, in a second, but, but really, you know, even in this form, uh, you know, this is something that's been used all over the place. We started looking at this uh, because of the domain of sustainable data center design. So it turns out this is a really nice tool for capturing uh, if you want to adjust the capacity of a data center to match you know, the workload coming in and the availability of renewable energy and these sorts of things. Uh, you can do, after a lot of modeling work, you can fit it into this framework. And we've actually been very successful there. So you know, it's not just a, you know, an application that I throw up there and hand wave away. We've released products with HP, and, and these sorts of algorithms are actually running in Apple data centers, managing the renewable resources uh, of, you know, of their portfolio. Uh, we've also been, you know, since then, this is stuff that uh, is uh, with Yisong Yu, who is the leader at, at Caltech. We've been applying the same algorithms to uh, speech planning and camera planning, or speech animation and camera planning with Disney. Uh, and so here, so actually, I should say, where does the switching cost come in data centers? So the switching cost comes in data centers because uh, when you turn on or off a server or you switch it into an out of power savings mode, the wear and tear cost of doing that is about the same as running a server for half an hour to an hour. Uh, and so you really have to think carefully of whether you want to turn things off or on uh, before you do it. And you know, that cost is on the order of the operation cost. Uh, so you, you can't ignore it. And so that gives you kind of this smoothing turn here uh, the cost is then associated with the actual performance and energy of having the servers on. Uh, in these two, you know, in camera planning, you of course need the switching cost is capturing the fact that you don't want to move a camera if you're watching a sporting event, for example, and just jerk it and jerk it, jerk it. You want to move it smoothly. And so you need some regularizer to ensure smooth movement. Uh, and the same thing in speech animation. Yeah. And so I can tell you more about those offline, but uh, the work on camera planning was in Sports Illustrated this summer, uh, and the animation stuff is, is being uh, uh, productized by Disney right now for some of their uh, upcoming movies. Um, and so it's a real practical model where you can make impact with algorithms. And, and all three of those cases that we've been working on, predictions are really crucial to the way you use them in practice. You don't use it in an absence of information about the future. You have a lot of information that is accurate but not precise about the future, and you need to figure out how to use it. And you want to use it differently depending on the structure of the noise in these algorithms. Uh, and so you know, just to be, you know, give us some context to, before we move to predictions, if you, if you think about the way people analyze these, there's, uh, it's sort of silly to call it two communities, but really there's two metrics uh, that people work on when they study these problems, uh, regret or competitive ratio. And, uh, and basically, I don't need to put this up for this, but I, I want to put it up just to highlight that the difference between them, you know, regret is additive, competitive ratio is multiplicative, but the key difference is in regret you're comparing to a best static choice, and in competitive ratio you're comparing to the true offline optimal, which, which may be dynamic in this setting. Uh, and in, in the uh, data center case, as an example, really what you want is both of these. Uh, so in the data center case, comparing to regret is like saying, Currently, you're running a static set of servers. If you're going to switch to a dynamic policy, 
uh, you want it to do better than what you're getting with a static set of servers, so you want no regret. Uh, but if you're going to switch, you don't want to have to switch again a year later, so you want to be near optimal to make the switch. And so when we were interacting with HP and, and the other companies around these things, in some sense, the big argument for them was that we could do well for both of these. And if we were only doing well for one of them, they wouldn't have been willing to take up the algorithms. And so it was really something where you wanted an algorithm for both of these measures. And you know, if you look at the literature, there are very few papers, maybe some from Avram uh, aside, uh, that, that are really looking at both. And so for regret, you want to be sublinear regret. For, constant, for competitive ratio, you want to be a constant. And you know, the much less studied problem is, is can you do both? So, uh, yeah, so I think everybody in here probably knows a lot of these, so I, I kind of am going to go over this really quickly, but if, you, if you're not familiar with this literature, please speak up and ask a question. Uh, you know, if, if you think of algorithms for OCO that do well for regret, almost anything works well, gradient descent, Newton's method, I mean, it's pretty easy to be no regret. And most of those initial algorithms are proven in the case where you don't have switching costs. Adding a switching cost doesn't change anything. You, you add a switching cost, you get basically the same bounds, and it just magically turns out that the cost from the switching cost balances precisely with the cost from the actual online or the actual uh, convex function, and so things just work out really nicely. Uh, and so you know, there you can do really well. You can be you know or to or to regret, and with pretty simple algorithms, competitive ratio is not as satisfying. So to do well for competitive ratio here. Basically, it's only possible to do that in low dimensions. So there's a three competitive algorithm that's deterministic for one dimension, two competitive randomized. In two dimensions already, there's not really a, a clean identification of the constant, but you can be constant competitive. Uh, beyond that, there's no constant competitive algorithms that I know of. Uh, the the two-dimensional is on upon the one, uh, the one dimensional we did a few years ago. Uh, and so basically, you, know, you can only do well in low dimensional cases. and, and for high dimension, we know that it's, uh, you can't have a constant competitive. In between, it's not completely clear for this model. Um, and so you know, this is pretty good. This is OK. You, you'd hope that at least for slow dimensions, you could do well here. Uh, and maybe the surprising thing, this is, this is a result that we had just a few years ago, is that you can't do well for both, even in a one dimensional case. Uh, and so it's really you know, without predictions, without some knowledge about the future, you're kind of stuck if you want to try to be good compared to the static solution and uh, within a constant factor of the optimal solution. Uh, and this is, this is a little bit weird, so it's useful to get some intuition for why this is true. Uh, and basically, the reason why is, in some sense, if you want to do well for regret, you have to be very much like gradient descent. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? Well, you can prove you know, uh, that you can't do well for both, which is, this is the formal statement. Uh, with just instances that mix between two linear cost functions. So you have a, you know, one that sloped one way, one that sloped the other way. And what, what happens if you do a gradient descent-like algorithm here? You basically get stuck on the upper envelope of this, because wherever you are, the adversary can give you that side. You're going to make a small step in the gradient direction. Uh, when you cross over, you're going to stay on the upper envelope, and then you're going to settle back down, and you're going to end up around there. Right? Uh, and so that's great, because you're matching the static optimal. But now I just choose these slopes, and I can make that very far away from the dynamic optimal. And so no algorithm that's kind of learning that point uh, can be good for competitive ratio. Uh, and on the other hand, if you're going to do well for competitive ratio, you can show that you have to be kind of sticky and make big jumps. And so to do well for competitive ratio, you basically uh, stick at one point. Uh, you, you play it. It's good for a little while. Eventually, the adversary makes it bad. But you stick with it for enough time that it's, you're sure it's worth it to switch. Uh, and then you have to switch all the way over to the other side. You don't, you know, you don't, there's no messing around. You just take the big jump to the good side. You, and you'll do the same thing. You'll stick there while it's good for a while. Eventually, the adversary will give you a bad cost. But you'll stick with it uh, until you're sure that it's worth it to switch. And you can think of the ski rental problem. You stick with it until your cost is at least as what, much as what it would be to swap over to the other side. Uh, and then you come back. And so this is great for staying within a constant factor of the optimal, because if you're, if, you're if you're just the right level of stickiness, you're staying close to this. But if I make the static optimal really close to the dynamic optimal, you're giving up more than an you know, additive factor compared to the, dynamic, or compared to the static optimal. Uh, and so you can basically show that this is, you know, that little hand wavy thing is completely formal. 
Uh, you have to, to do well for competitive ratio, you have to be sticky like that to do well for regret. You have to be kind of learning the upper envelope. Uh, and so there's no way an algorithm can do both. And so it's kind of disappointing. And, but it really kind of motivates two, you know, in some sense, lower bounds that you'd hope you could get around using information about the future by using some sort of beyond worst case analysis. Uh, and that's kind of what, the, what I'll tell you today is that in some sense, what you'd hope is, you know, I, I can do well for higher dimensions uh, for competitive ratio if I use predictions, and I could do well for them jointly too if I use predictions. Uh, and basically the answer to both of those will be yes, you can do well for them jointly, and yes, you can, uh, and using pretty simple algorithms, but we'll, we'll take a little while to get there. Uh, any questions about that part? OK, so before we can get to there, I have to say I have to give you a model for predictions. So so far, I've just it's been the classic online version of both of these problems. So the way I'm going to incorporate predictions into these is to basically view these as tracking problems. And so you can think of this as like a lasso type problem, an online lasso where we have some you know, parameter y of t that is maybe the optimal configuration of your data center, and you're trying to stay as close to that as possible. Uh, you have predictions of the solar, you have predictions of the workloads, and this lets you sort of have a forecast of what the optimal configuration will be, and you're wanting to stay as close to that as possible. Now, your forecasts are time dependent and evolving over time. So imagine you know, that maybe you know the current one, uh, but at time t, you have a prediction of y of t uh, plus 1 and a prediction of y of t plus 2 and so on. Uh, and these are possibly noisy. We'll talk about how we model the noise and what those look like uh, over the next few slides. But just right now, think of them as general. Uh, and you know, the idea is then to do well. And so, so you think of you know, at time 1, you're making a decision with some noisy information. Or at time 0, you're making a decision x1 with some noisy information about the future. Then you get a realization, uh, you have, but you have new updated predictions about the future because one time step went by. You learned a little bit more, so your predictions were refined, uh, and then you go forward in that way. Okay. So that's kind of the information flow. Lasso is a good example to think of for what this parameterized cost function might be, but you know, we don't care what that is for our results. It's just convex. Uh, do you have a model for how past data is assimilated to build? Yeah, I'll, t I'll get to that in a second. So, so right now I haven't told you anything about what these predictions actually look like. Uh, and I think that's the, the rub in all of this, is uh, what is a good way of modeling the evolution of predictions that still lets us do analysis. And this is where we get between kind of stochastic and worst case in the, in the viewpoint today. So, but before we get to that, we'll just do the, the, the model that probably everybody here is most familiar with first so that we can see how it works and what's kind of pretty unsatisfying about it. Uh. So you know, then this is where we started. You know, the, the, the TCS you know, vanilla view would be, OK, we have predictions at any given point. I'll say I can look ahead perfectly for some prediction window size, w steps. You know, if I want to be a little bit fancy, maybe I'll say I can look ahead, and they're going to be some distribution error, but the error is going to be bounded by epsilon uh, within that window. And then beyond that, it's adversarial. Right? This is, there's tons of papers like this in lots of domains. Uh, and it's kind of, it's the natural thing to do, right? Uh, but let's see what the consequence is here. So on the algorithmic side, given this model and given predictions in these online problems, if you have any connection with control theory, there's an immediate thing that you think to do, which is model predictive control or receding horizon control. And this is the gener generic answer for all problems like this is some variation of, of receding horizon control. And what we mean by that is you look at the information you have. You have w steps of prediction. So we're going to use those w steps of prediction. We know they're perfect. So given that they're perfect, let's just solve the problem optimally, given that information. Uh, that gives us you know, the, a trajectory xt plus 1 through xt plus w. The first one of those we're going to implement, we're going to use, and then we're going to move on. Uh, and then we'll get you know, our update. Since, the, since this is perfect, actually, I didn't even need to be this general about the way I wrote this, because these ones are exactly the same. You just get one new piece of information. Uh, and that's now the perfect prediction of time w plus 1. You use that, you do your prediction, and so on. OK, so what do we get? So with this model, you get something that's OK. In one dimension, you get what you'd hope for which is uh, your, as your prediction window gets larger and larger, you get closer and closer to the optimal, and it decays kind of 
as well as you could hope. You can show that no algorithm is going to be able to do better than this. Uh, and you know, the, and that's, that's kind of, you get sort of a 1 plus 1 over w. Your prediction window is long enough. You're, close, you're basically optimal. The problem is uh, outside of one dimension, you don't get this behavior anymore. In fact, you're lower bounded by a constant. Uh, and you just, beyond a point, don't get any better as you get more information, even though the extra information you're getting is perfect. And this is a little weird. Uh, uh, and so it doesn't improve as two goes. And, and this is, I, I have too much to say. Otherwise, I would stop here and show you an example of why. But it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive as to why uh, this might happen. But basically, the idea is you're not sticky enough. You're, you're, you can be convinced to move uh, you know, x1 a lot every time step uh, because you're not paying attention to why you got where you are. You're not looking past it all. So you don't remember that you just took a big move to get where you are. And you're very willing to take another big move right away. Uh, and the adversary can take advantage of that. Um, so you need to fix something. The, the fix, or one, one way to fix this, is something that, uh, uh, you know, a tweak of uh, receiving horizon control that uh, we call averaging fixed horizon control. Uh, and this now, I'll tell you what it is in a second, but it works. You get 1 plus 1 over w for any dimension. Uh, you know, so it's, it's exactly you know, you know, what the best you could hope for in this up to constants. Um, so what it does is it basically combines a bunch of worse algorithms, or a bunch of really stupid algorithms. And so it combines a bunch of fixed horizon control algorithms, which what they do is they look at the information you have, you know, t plus 1 of t plus w. And instead of, you know, this is exactly what uh, receding horizon control would do, but receding horizon control would only implement the first one and then move forward and you know, use new information to compute the next step. Fixed horizon control says, OK, I'll just do all of those. I'll wash my hands of it. I won't pay attention to any new information until that whole window has passed. Uh, and then I'll start to look at the predictions again. Uh, and I'll do the next step, and I'll just spin things that way. So, so what averaging fixed horizon control does is it takes w of those algorithms, and it averages the choices uh, of them in any given step. So it's kind of a smooth or regularized version of weaker algorithms. And the intuition for it connects with what I was saying. This, in a sense, you pay attention to why you got where you are, because you're paying attention to an algorithm that made this choice. And so you're averaging why you got where you are with the ones that are purely look ahead. So you're having some that are purely looking ahead and some that are purely looking backwards. And so it, the average kind of balances that. And, and the average is really important here. If you, if you don't do a uniform average, this doesn't work. It has to be a uniform average or, or, or a uniform mixture of these if you prefer to think randomized uh, to get this result. So by uniform mixture, you mean I just pick a yeah. so windowing strategy and just change the boundary from the window? Yeah, so you could imagine you know, two ways to implement. One is averaging. The other is just I have w of them. I'll pick one of them. That'll be my action. And I do that uniform way at random. How does uh, w scale with the horizon? The full horizon for the problem? Which so if they're completely independent right now. So the full horizon is capital T. Whatever W you pick, that's the bound that you get. I'm just wondering about the previous result. Oh, yeah, in the, in the, in the bad result? Yeah. In the bad result, it doesn't scale with that, but there's a tie between the dimension and W that you need to get the adversarial result to work out. But the capital T doesn't matter in any of these. I was just naively, if W was equal to capital T. Yeah, then you're fine, yeah. OK, so there's a but here. So this, this is you know, great in terms of you improve with prediction window. Uh, but still, you can't. this doesn't do well for both competitive ratio and regret. Uh, and in fact, you can show that no, in this model of perfect predictions with adversarial after your w, there's no online algorithm that can do well for competitive ratio and regret again. And this is basically, you can just take the same example that I showed you before and, and extend it up. It's not such a hard proof to show this. And so really, you need, you, you need uh, more than constant look ahead uh, to be able to do well for both here. And, and this just isn't satisfying. Actually, both of these results aren't very satisfying. Uh, because you know, you're, you're needing unbounded prediction windows to do well in both. right? So if you're going to be near optimal here, you need to look really far ahead. Uh, and if you're going to be uh, you know, constant competitive and no regret, you're going to look really far ahead. And if we think about reality, the further I look ahead, the more noisy this information is, the less likely it's actually going to be useful. So if doing well really depends on looking two years ahead with my forecast, I'm not going to do well in a real situation because those two-year forecasts are going to be basically useless. 
And so there's just, you know, it, I view these results as basically showing what's wrong with the model of perfect look ahead rather than as uh, useful results in themselves. Uh, and I think, you know, it, then it makes you go back. It, it really shows that, you, you know, the, you're both too optimistic and too pessimistic in this result, but the pessimism is kind of, you know, the optimism lets you get the positive result, but the pessimism is still so much that you can't get over the regret versus uh, competitive ratio lower bound. So both cause problems. So what do you do if you want to improve this? What's the next model that you could think about? Well, you could say, let me say ID noise for each of these predictions. Uh, you know, that's not so great. You're not getting refined. Well, maybe you could make it, and, you're, and also you're not getting worse as you look ahead. Maybe you could make it depend on how far you're looking ahead, but then how do you refine it? It's, it's kind of, and also correlation structure is really the key thing. If, if, if it's sunny at noon tomorrow, it's likely sunny at 12.01 tomorrow. So if I'm forecasting solar, uh, you know, that's going to be important. If I think it's going to be sunny and it's actually cloudy at noon, it's probably still cloudy at 12.01. That correlation structure is going to dominate my air, actually. It's not, it's not something that you can ignore. And so you, you, this is sort of not really a, a natural way to go in for practical situations. Maybe you can do something stochastic, but then you're so specific to the model. If you think about the data center example where you're trying to you know, you're integrate renewable energy into a data center, you would need to have a stochastic model for the workloads, a stochastic model for the solar, a stochastic model for the temperature outside so that you can understand its impact on cooling. You'd need to put all these together. You'd need to make assumptions in all of these places. And you know, then all of a sudden, your result will be really fragile to all those assumptions. That's not a, a, a natural way to go either. Um, yeah, so, so what do you do? Uh, so uh, what I'm going to show you is our best attempt so far. Uh, it's far from perfect, but I think it's already a, a big step towards having something that is much more general while also being practical and uh, tractable uh, in, in terms of looking at these. Uh, and I can sort of summarize, the, the idea of it is you take a noisy prediction model from the filtering community uh, and you use that in the context of an adversarial analysis. So that's the high level, and I'll explain what that means here. And so basically, the prediction noise is going to satisfy this. So the whole model for the prediction noise is on the screen right now. Uh, the, the way to think of it is, you know, the real value, think of, maybe it's easier to write this with a minus. So this minus this is your prediction noise. Right? And so your prediction noise uh, is captured by this, where you have your uh, per step noise, which is IID. So this is kind of, if you look one step ahead, how much uncertainty is there? Uh, and that's reasonable to be IID, zero mean, uh, all that sort of stuff. But then you weight it by some sort of an impulse function, which captures the correlation structure. And this looks familiar to anybody who's took in a, a class in EE around signal processing and filtering. Um, but we're using it in a very different way than they do. And so, so what does this give you? Uh, if you kind of unroll it a little bit, you see that basically if you move one step forward, your predictions are refined in a very natural way because you've learned one of these E of S. You've, you've learned the realization of one of these. So you have a nice kind of filtration of how these predictions evolve. Uh, and, you know, because of this you know, additive noise thing, as you look further ahead, of course, there's extra noise. There's more of these that you don't know. So your variance goes up exactly the way you'd think you'd want it to. Uh, you can get basically any correlation structure you want uh, by putting in Fs of different forms. So short range, wrong range, ID would just be one and all zeros. You know, all of these sorts of things are just special cases of this. Uh, and you know, even better, if you're really writing the optimal predictor for a wide sense stationary process, that's a wiener filter. The noise looks like this. If you're writing a you know, way to move an average filter for a random walk, the noise obeys this properties. Same thing with common filters and linear dynamical systems. This is, this, is the noise, this is the real noise structure. And more generally, you can prove that, you know, kind of axiomatically, any, any linear predictor in a stationary environment is going to have noise that satisfies this form. So it really captures what you'd expect if you were using a predictor in a context where it was designed for. Uh, but the important thing is I haven't said anything about the underlying process. I can tell you what the noise process looks like without saying anything about the instance. And so we can use this noise process and now study still an adversarial instance for the problem. And so the idea is, you know, it's really beyond worst case in the sense that, you know, you're still, well, you can think of it as either specifying the initial predictions or specifying the, the Y of T itself. The adversary is giving you that. 
And now it's kind of a, you know, there's a, noisy, there's a noisy oracle that the adversary has to give you to. So the adversary specifies the instance to make you bad, but along with it, they have to give you a noisy oracle, and this constrains what that noisy oracle can do. So that's the model. And you know, it's only useful in the sense that it, it, it's pretty general, and we can actually do analysis now for OCO subject to this noise. Uh, and so how well can an algorithm do? Here's, here's the result for FHC. So this is that averaging of the dumb fixed horizon control algorithms. So if you have averaging fixed horizon control, you can have a constant competitive ratio and sublinear regret with a constant size prediction window. Uh, and you can actually, the, the key thing here is you can actually figure out what the optimal length to look ahead is. Because you know, depending on the correlation structure and the noise structure and how bad things get, you don't want to look too far ahead. You actually want to optimize what information you're using in your algorithm. Uh, and so there is such an optimal. That optimal is always a constant look ahead length. Uh, and you can define it in a very computationally tractable way. Uh, and then there's, there's sort of one caveat, which is under this prediction model, you can't always do well. And so these conditions are basically capturing when it's, when it's possible to have a constant competitive ratio for any algorithm or a sublinear gut for any algorithm. And so if it's possible for an algorithm to do it, AFHG does it, and it does both simultaneously. What's STA? Which one? STA. Oh, sorry, static. Uh, so that's, that's static, yeah. And so this, if the static cost is at least that, the optimal cost is at least that. Uh, and then I wrote it in expectation, but there's concentrations results that you can prove here, too. And you can talk to me about that offline if you want. Um, so that's kind of the first cut. And it, this kind of gets at one of the points, which is like, we can now sort of use a result like this, at least for AFHC, to say how you should design the algorithm differently. How far should the algorithm look ahead, depending on whether the prediction errors are noisy or not, correlated or not, all these sorts of things. Uh, but it doesn't really say much about how you design the algorithm yet, because this is just one particular algorithm. Uh, you know, do you always want to use AFHC? Or, or are there some correlation structures where you would want to use receding horizon control or some other algorithm like that? You know, we, we don't have that yet. So you know, can you do better? Uh, and you, know, you can. And, and actually, for some class, we, you know, we have a first result that shows how you can tune an algorithm depending on the correlation structure of the predictions and that you really do want to do very different things depending on the correlation structure. Yeah. Uh, did you assume that the process E is white? Uh, you that? No, you don't no distributional assumptions other than unbiased. Uh, and yeah, that's it. But they can have E, can have correlation. Yeah. Oh, oh no, the, sorry, the, the E are IID, but sorry, white, I, I thought you were hinting at Gaussian. No. So they're, they are IID, but they're arbitrary distribution. Yeah. OK. So, to get at this idea of how you tune an algorithm for, for the prediction noise structure, uh, we'll look at a particular class of algorithms. I mean, we made this up. This isn't a common class, but, but it's a pretty general one in the context of uh, receding horizon control-like algorithms. Uh, and so I call these committed horizon control mechanisms. And it's kind of the natural generalization of the two algorithms I've shown you so far, uh, where you do exactly the same thing you know, with your fixed horizon control algorithm. AFHC would have done the whole trajectory here. MPC would have done one. Uh, and I kind of view this as committing to these. So, so fixed horizon control commits to all of them and, and doesn't change its mind even if new information comes in. Uh, and so we're going to commit to some number of them, V. And V is kind of between one and the prediction window length. And you get you know, MPC or, or sorry, or receding horizon control if you do V equals one. And you get AFHC if you do V equals W. And you can imagine wanting to do something in between, or maybe or maybe not, depending on the noise structure. And, and that's what we can get at. And so you're doing all these, and then again, you're averaging. Uh, and like I said before, the, in, in this kind of algorithm, you, you basically always want to average. There's nothing really to improve by doing some other weighted average here. You really don't want to do a uniform average. And for any given algorithm, it's, it's pretty easy to, or not easy, but you can get results for how to optimize W. And so the key design choice that's really not understood about these algorithms is this commitment level. What's the impact of that? And so you know, just to, to get you to try to anticipate the results a little bit, you can think for yourself now if, if maybe the easiest case is IID. So suppose prediction noise is completely IID, so that impulse function, that f, is just 1 and then all zeros. Would you want to do receding horizon control? Would you want to do AFHC? Would you want to have something in between? 
wasn't obvious to me at all what, what you would want to do for even the IID case, whether you would want to do something in between or not. Uh, but we can give some results that provide into that. And so this, this I've, I've simplified the form here, so you don't see the prediction window in this, you just see the Vs. That keeps it cleaner to understand the, the talk. But this is, this is what we can do uh, to help us get at this. So this is, we've, we've now made an assumption on the, on the cost function, so alpha holder. Uh, and we are assuming that the F is bounded, which we didn't need either of those for the previous result, but here, to make it clean, you do. And, and we tend to look at competitive difference in our analyses, because then you can get from a kind of, uh, there's a quick route to either competitive ratio or regret, depending on, on where you want to go. So it's, it's nice to bound this first. And so basically what you get here, I, I guess parameter-wise, that's the bound for the D, the G and the alpha are from the definition of uh, alpha holder. Uh, but the, the, right, the structure of this result is basically that you get a turn from that is captured what you pay due to switching costs and a term that's captured from what you pay due to prediction error. Uh, and the prediction error term, this, this summation over here, the, the FK, uh, is the prediction error that you incur in the first k-steps. So uh, the k-step prediction error, uh, that's FK. And so it's a pretty simple form, actually. And you know, in trying to interpret it, if we come back to these questions, basically it's those questions are asking, what's the impact of these Vs? Uh, and you can see that the impact of commitment on, pr on switching costs is pretty clear. The more commitment you have, the better things get. And this is the intuition I tried to give you about AFHC, where it's, it's forcing you to be more sticky. You pay attention to the past, and so you're not willing, you're not, it's not as easy to fool you into switching as it is for an algorithm like RHC. Uh, but over here, you start to see that you, the correlation structure is really going to matter, because the correlation structure is going to impact your k-step prediction error and how that averages over k. Uh, and so depending on how this interacts with this, you're gonna get a very different, you know, either an intermediate V, a small V, or a large V as your optimal in the whole thing. Uh, and just to sort of work through this, if you take the case of IID noise, we have one and all zeros. You know, this is nice and easy. This part goes away, you get this, and you see that this term becomes a constant. And so, you know, V should be very large, so AFHC is best. Uh, so it's very easy to work out what it is in that case. The other cases are more complicated, but you can start to look at them too. So here's kind of the, the efficiency bound as a function of V. So efficiency bound V, this is the IED case. You know, this V is large is better. Uh, if you go to something that's long range correlated, you get completely the opposite behavior. So you want to do something like RHC and, you know, really move quickly if the, if the prediction error is long range correlated in most cases. Uh, short range correlated, it's a little bit, you know, it's, nice, it's non monotonic it's a little interesting in shape. Uh, and you can think of other interesting cases. If the correlation error is exponentially decaying, you get again something that has this you know, non-monotonic uh, but, but convex shape. Uh, and you can start to work these out from the theorem. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm making this a little simpler. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't interpret that all short range dependent look like this, all long range dependent look like this, and so on. It's, it's actually really delicate, and it depends on the weighting of the switching costs and the, and the prediction term. So there's thresholding behavior for each one of these cases. But that really highlights even more why you need results like this one. Because you know, it's, as far as we can tell, there's not a real general answer. There's, there's, there's thresholds. But if you want to try to figure out for a particular correlation structure, it really depends on how, how impactful the switching costs are. And you can have really very different behaviors, depending on the structure, how, how the prediction error impacts the design of the algorithm. Yeah. So th that graph was just graphing your bounds? Yeah. Are your bounds tight enough I can sort of take that at face value? Or? They're, yeah. Uh, so they're, they're very tight. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think you know, this I view as the, the kind of main result of the talk uh, in the sense that it really, as far as I know, it's kind of a first case, at least in the results I'm aware of, where you can say structural properties of prediction noise change the as design of the algorithm. Uh, and clearly it's limited, right? This is one particular class of algorithms. I, I have no claim that these are the best algorithms for this problem. There's going to be other ways that you can do this. But this is, at least within the class of model predictive control algorithms, uh, kind of a capturing the, how you design them as a function of the prediction error. And I think there's lots of open questions taking this theme more generally. So, so in fact, kind of the goal of the talk isn't so much for you to you know, walk out and talk about that result, and I'm hoping instead you walk out and you say, okay, predictions in the context of online algorithms, this is important. You know, in this one talk, we did it for a particular class of algorithms in a particular problem, and we can kind of understand how you optimize W to capture the accuracy and how you optimize V to capture the correlation structure. But how does this impact other problems, route planning problems, you know, problems in, in very different cases, chasing subspace problems. You can think of lots of contexts where 
basically any online problem, add predictions about the future uh, you know, pieces of the instance, how, do, how does that change the design of the algorithm? Mm -hmm. I think you know, it's, a, it's a very important pro uh, problem for practice, and, and hopefully we can make some progress in developing a theory that can guide people to so do this every day. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah. So in designing this model predictive control algorithms, do you think discounting would help you in some cases where your, your long range predictions are discounted by, by some geometric factor or something like that? Yeah. In some sense, instead of having this fixed W, uh, have a discount. I, I doubt it will make much of a difference, honestly. Uh, uh, yeah. I, we, we didn't investigate it that much because you can already do pretty well with the hard threshold, and, and that's kind of the way most of these algorithms look. It, it's a little hard to say. You know, if you just start discounting too much, then you know, if, you, if you take a geometric discount, then you're just going to basically be ignoring those anyway, so you might as well threshold at some point. Uh, and that's kind of our intuition, but, but it would be interesting to look at and see if that intuition is right. Uh, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. Just a related question to this is that what happens if you are thinking in terms of now maximization? But I mean, like in the data center case, you have some revenue maximization yeah. subject to some, you know, all of these costs or something like that. Yeah, the same stuff is fine. So, so that in I can talk to you about the data centers offline, but you know, the, nothing changes in this story uh, if you look at that. Go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things it's sort of like kind of the classic online algorithms work by case server problems where kind of people thought little about predictions and then kind of gave up is that you could sort of have an adversary sort of slow the world down. So you get a request and you get like, you know, a bunch of requests all at the same point giving you no information, costing you zero, costing yeah. the other guy zero, it's like nothing. And then you get a request here, get a bunch of times, kind of slows the world down, your predictions. Um, I, I, as, as I get, one way you get around that sort of thing is that you say if the overall cost is low, that's actually kind of okay. That's, that's okay, yeah, and that's why looking at the competitive difference makes makes that kind of go away, and that's true. And the other way is the correlation structure gives a lot of information that you don't have when you look at these adversarial models like what people were doing in the case server problems. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.